Hey, good morning, everybody, and welcome to another Mortgage Coach Tuesday call. Uh, my name is Dave Savage. I'm the CEO of Mortgage Coach. I'm excited to have uh, two awesome guests today. So the two guests today are both Dan Rawich and Kristen Messerly. Kristen is going to go first. Uh, Kristen, welcome to the call. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Good. Well, thanks for showing up, and thanks for always pushing us to, to jump on video. We also have Mr. Dan Rawich. I, Dan, have you been able to join the call yet? Yep. Yes, sir. I'm back. All right. So, so Dan, in the second half of the call, is going to provide uh, a market forecast on what Dan uh, thinks is going to happen in 2016, maybe a little bit of an update on last year. But we're really doing this with the focus of not only providing leadership to you, but providing leadership to realtors. So Kristen was very intentional around what she's doing, and the message that she's providing is great leadership for the mortgage industry and for lenders, but we're recording it. So this will be something that you can forward to your realtors, and at the conclusion of uh, Kristen's keynote and her briefing, uh, she's also got a nice new feature that she's adding to the Mortgage Coach community. So we'll announce that in just a minute. So, so Kristen, this is, I think, the third or fourth time you've been a guest. Is that about right? Yep, I think fourth. Yeah. Yeah, fourth. And I think it's just been a little over a year ago when I met Kristen at an MBA event. Uh, I was actually introduced to her by uh, Mitch Kider. And the way Mitch introduced you was, Dave, this is someone that you need to meet, someone you need to know. Uh, not only is she doing amazing things in bringing the millennial message to the market, but she's increasing compliance at the same time. And I'm like, hmm, that's interesting. So uh, you have rocked it on all the calls that you've been on. Really looking forward to you uh, showing loan officers and think of it as realtors, how they can mm -hmm. crush it with millennials. So, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm excited to be here. I absolutely love the, the Mortgage Coach community. So happy to be a part of this and um, glad to be back on another call. Right on. Well, we, I'll tell you when I can see your screen and Kristen is going to walk us through a keynote uh, providing leadership again to both lenders and realtors on how to crush it with millennials. And Dan, uh, okay. feel free, think of, think of your role for this first half of the call as a co-host with me and let's bring this to the, to the street for mortgage coach professionals. And Kristen, we'll let you know when you, we can see your screen. Okay, you can't see my screen? Not yet. Okay. Yeah. Marcy, well. can you see it? It says I'm showing my screen. Let's see. Let's try again. Can you see it yet? No. Oh, we can boom. see it now. We see it. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to uh, technical difficulties. Uh, this always happens to me, and yet I'm supposed to be the millennial tech person here. Okay. All right. So I am so excited to talk to you guys today about increasing production with millennials. Um, this is a topic that as, um, sorry, I've got to get rid of this. I only see myself right now. So I'm going to, there we go. Okay. Okay. So I, I grew up in the mortgage industry. My dad had a, a mortgage company when I was young and I, I grew up understanding the value of homeownership to um, communities and families. But I've also watched as I've gotten older how um, I, I think a lot of people have a hard time communicating that value to today's generation of first-time home buyers, um, which is my generation. So I'm very passionate about helping you guys to be able to communicate that message um, in a way that my generation will understand it and be able to, to move forward in, um, in accepting this kind of value. So that's what I'm going to be talking about today. And of course, Dan and Dave jump in any time. Um, first of all, I want to just kind of give, give an overview of millennials. If you haven't been on my calls before, seen some of the mortgage coach materials out there, um, millennials are anyone between the ages of 18 and 34, and uh, we are the most diverse generation, the largest generation in history, and most diverse. 46%, according to the U.S. Census, now identify as minorities. Um, and the interesting thing here is that, as a whole, we value diversity. We care whenever companies are demonstrating a value for diversity, and we're taking parts of other cultures and making them as part of our own. So it's not just that we are nearly half minorities. It's that all of us are really diverse in our cultures and in, in the way that we make purchasing decisions as well. So we're also huge. By 2020, we're going to make up three-fourths of the workforce, um, and, and we're also purchasing homes. So as much as we have heard in the news that millennials are not buying and that we don't care about homeownership, that's 
completely untrue. Um, over 90% of millennials say they want to buy a home in the near future. And just in December of this last year, 28% of all home sales went to millennials. Um, so we know that the opportunity is here. We know that millennials are buying. We know that we need um, mortgage lenders and realtors to help us in the process. Um, but just because we have this kind of um, massive surge in the marketplace, with millennials, it does not mean that you're going to get their business automatically. We, and this is where there's a really distinct difference from the millennial generation compared with other previous generations. Because having grown up with access to information at our fingertips at all times, we have natively become uh, researchers before we make any purchasing decision. And you know, Dave and I have talked about this, where millennial trends are across the board of different generations. I mean, everyone does research now before making a purchasing decision. But the difference is that it's a native part of our language and, and decision-making process for millennials. We automatically, of course, when we buy anything, we're going to search on Yelp and look around online, check out customer reviews, um, and then we're going to make a decision based on our, the results of our research. So when we go on Yelp and look for a lender, you can see here it's like over 21,000 um, options available to you. To us. Um, so what makes you get to the top of our list? And that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, for some reason, can everyone still see my screen? Yeah, we still see it, Kristen. And now okay. it's one. Well, Great. And by the way, if, if, if your computer is doing it, you might want to just take away the video um, so you can see the screen, but I'll leave that to you. Okay, well, as long as you can see it, I'm good. So, um, so I want, I'm going to be talking about how you can update your map and how you, how you reach the millennial generation. We um, have distinct purchasing preferences and, and differences from previous generations, and so, um, so I'm going to be kind of talking through that. But Dave and Dan, do you have any, anything to add to what I've been talking about? I'll let Dan go first because I've you know, obviously interviewed you a few times. Dan, any thoughts or comments that come to mind? Well, I, I would just say, uh, uh, being uh, my age, I have uh, three daughters. Although, uh, Chris, you'd have to tell me, my youngest is 16 and a half, so she thinks she's a millennial, but I think she wants to be like her big sisters. I said you're nothing, so uh, she doesn't really like that. <laughs> you're nothing. But, uh, you are I nothing until uh, you're 18. So. <laughs> yep, so sorry, she's nothing still. Um, <laughs> but my older daughters, uh, 32 and 28, um, it's been fascinating to watch how they make decisions. And um, I'm really excited to hear what you're saying. I did not know that that high of a percentage of millennials were actually buying homes. Um, and when I do my economic forecast later, so much of my forecast of the coming times has to do with the aging of your population and how they come into the buying age. So I love this. Awesome. So interesting. That's great. Yeah, so I think, um, and this is where I'm going to shift into or start talking about cultural empathy, but understand, which is basically understanding your consumers values and trends, um, really get stepping in the shoes of your consumer. Um, but this is the defining factor, I would say, in reaching millennials. This is kind of the whole thing. is about um, really understanding your consumers. And that's, that's different from what we had to do previously. Like, we, we were, I think we have the largest consumer gaps in history because of the technology boom. Um, so it's really important that you try, I mean, it's, um, it's difficult because with any different culture from our own, it feels uncomfortable, and it, it can feel like, like if you've ever learned another language or um, lived in another a foreign country, you understand how um, when you're translating a message, it can be very uncomfortable, and sometimes it doesn't translate exactly how you want it to, to be translated, but the point is that you start stepping outside of your comfort zone and your um, way of seeing the world and seeing the way a purchasing experience should look like and start trying to imagine what your customer wants to have in that customer experience. Um, so I'm going to talk through some of that. But um, like I said, with the technology boom, this is just a, a, a very big difference from previous, what previous generations had available to them. I mean, um, just, you know, talking about going on Yelp to look for a lender or a realtor, but we go on Yelp to, or look at Amazon reviews um, when I'm buying a, a candle. <laughs> I mean, something as stupid as that where... Um, we'll be looking, doing our research, and that, and that um, creates a very informed consumer. Um, and of course, in this in this industry, 
there's a just black hole of information online. So we may think we're informed consumers, but then um, that creates the opportunity for you guys to be um, guides through the process and say, okay, this information, I know it's very overwhelming, or um, I know you read this, but it's actually, this is inaccurate or outdated. Um, so I think in this industry, we have a big opportunity to be another information resource to the millennial home buyer, which is really what we're looking for. Um, so our access has really changed the game in the way that we approach purchasing decisions. And, um, and as I said before, we, I think that the value that you provide is often lost in translation. Um, millennials have a lot of skepticism about the mortgage and real estate industry, and um, we're skeptical of people that we're going to work with. And I know you guys have amazing value to bring, um, but a lot of times, um, like I know a lot of millennials that are doing really well, um, making good money, and have talked about wanting to buy a home, but then they go online and it's very um, crazy, you know, just like I said, overwhelming amount of information, and, um, and they don't, don't trust a realtor or a lender to tell them the truth. And so we end up just saying, okay, I'm going to, I can't deal with this right now. I don't I don't trust it, so I'm going to not pay attention. I know one of the smartest people I know that's around my age um, had said, had thought you had to put 20% down in order to buy a home. And, um, and so there's just a lot of a lack of information out there and, um, and the value that, that you guys have to provide I think is often lost in the way that you're communicating it or, or that it's not being communicated in time because we're doing a lot of research before we ever talk to you. So I'm going to run through some of the just common mistakes that I see in this industry um, that would help to kind of frame the discussion and moving forward with best practices. First of all, social media. Social media is an absolute necessity. I mean, this is how we communicate. We are on a million different social media apps all the time, and it's just another form of communication. But um, I see companies very often posting stuff that is just really um, not only inappropriate sometimes, but non-compliant or, um, or just not, um, not communicating the value that you have to offer. Um, in this example with GAF, this is just kind of a classic GAF uh, where they said, all impacted by Sandy, stay safe, um, and then we'll be doing lots of shopping today, how about you? And it was just very inappropriate. So um, that's not the kind of thing I see so much with the mortgage and real estate industry, but it's often very salesy information that, um, that really doesn't appeal to the millennial home buyer. Um, okay. So um, I also see a lot of times on on Facebook, for example, you need to have a parent page on your on your Facebook profile um, for a company, and then underneath that you can have branch pages. Um, but what happens a lot of times is people start making pages, and then the first one that pops up is something that's got like 44 likes. It's not a um, it's not the main page, so you want to kind of be watching out for that. And then secondly, response time. Millennials are very used to, or accustomed to, um, having access to understanding what's going on in the process of purchasing something. Um, like when we, I've used this example before, but when we purchase a, or buy a pizza, order delivery, we can see when the pepperoni is being placed on the pizza. I mean, we are completely informed all the time, and we usually can look up information at any moment. Um, but whenever, I, a lot of times people don't realize how important responding to a question or a text um, can be to the millennial home buyer's overall experience. So they'll say, you know, I'm busy right now, and then they respond maybe a day later. But then they lose that customer. Um, so quick response time is really important. And then a salesy approach. Um, previous In previous generations, they wanted to be taken care of in a uh, purchasing process. Like, I went to buy a car, and, the, and a lot of times previous generations would want to go in and say, hey, you're the professional, I trust you, you take care of this, just get me my car. And they're like, you know, kind of selling and um, doing this whole sales tactic. And, um, and, but my generation goes in and, and says, uh, I want to know exactly how you're coming up with all of these numbers, and I want to um, be in a part of every aspect of the purchasing process. We want authenticity. We want to understand the person that we're doing business with. And if you're trying to sell me, I see through that right away. 
I think everyone on this call can probably um, relate to that that kind of feeling as a whole as a society we're much more skeptical of marketers and sales professionals but that can be unnatural for some people who have grown up in sales um, so and then not providing enough information number four would be um, someone who is uh, Again, we want to be informed and empowered consumers, and so we want to consume as much information as possible. And you have that information. You are extremely knowledgeable and valuable in this process, but a lot of times uh, you hold back because you think the consumer doesn't want to be overwhelmed with that information, which might be true in some cases, but definitely having the information available and making that known to the consumer sooner than later is going to be what gets you to the top of the list. Um, and then lastly, not communicating in the digital language. This is where I just absolutely love Mortgage Coach because you are able to communicate that value, the information as a, an, a valued advisor in the process through a, the native digital language of millennials. And so, um, but a lot of people avoid kind of coming on board with using tools and um, technology and that's just, it is another language. It's another kind of skill that you have to learn. And so it can be very difficult, um, like it is any time you're learning a new skill or a foreign language, but it's really important to be able to communicate with today's consumers. And I just want to throw out there that if we don't, and I don't like scare tactics or anything, but I am genuinely worried about the industry a little bit whenever people are so hesitant to adjust to the demand of Millennials and this large segment of, of first-time homebuyers are making up now 67% of first-time homebuyers. Uh, when companies like the cab industry did not adjust either, and they're being overtaken by Uber and ride-sharing apps like like Uber and Lyft, um, so they're struggling now. And I could see something like that happening in the mortgage industry. So I want us to be aware that while we've been doing business a certain way for a long period of time, um, now we have to start adjusting to consumer demand for more of the digital communication and we need to think about who is is what cultures are involved in every aspect of the process these are kind of the three main value providers or, or constituents I guess in the home buying process you want to understand your home buyer culture um, what different cultures are making up that that segment as well uh, where your culture is coming from as a loan officer or if you're a realtor, who your loan officer is, what their background is, what they're expecting from the process, and same thing with the realtor. So I'm going to walk through kind of understanding the millennial background and, and getting in the shoes of the millennial for a quick moment. Um, does anyone have anything to add to this before I, I move forward with that? Dan, I'll save my thoughts for the end, but do you have anything you want to jump in on? I'll follow your lead and save my thoughts as well. Loving this though, Kristen. Okay, awesome. So first of all, I've, I've gone through this before in previous calls, but so I'm going to walk through it pretty quickly. Um, but first of all, I want us to remember that the um, approach to home ownership is going to be different with millennials than previous generations. Um, previous generations tied home ownership very closely to the American dream and saw it as kind of an emotional attachment in a way. Um, it was the next step, next stage in life. But millennials see home ownership um, as a, an investment. They see it as um, I'm paying very high rent and home ownership makes more sense. And so, um, so communicating, again, that value doing the rent versus own kind of um, like calculations with them is really critical because that's what they're going to value. They value getting a return on their investment, much more so than an emotional attachment. And um, again, I see a lot of times marketing materials out there that are a picture of a big family in front of a big home with a white ticket fence and um, while that is still the dream for many millennials, the majority are more interested in the financial benefits of home ownership and so that kind of image is much less relevant today. And while of course millennials did not quite come out of the womb with an iPad in their hands, it was pretty close. And uh, hey, we have hey, grown Kristen. up. Yeah. Oh, there. Yeah. Yes. I wanted to let you know your images weren't moving, but I now see the digital image, the digital native. You're good. Okay, good. I don't know. Yeah, it's kind of glitching sometimes, so let me know. Um, no but yeah, so we have grown up with technology, which makes a very uh, distinct difference from previous generations. We do a ton of research, and we're extremely connected with each other. Uh, we're constantly talking to each other on apps. 
Um, the world is a lot smaller for us. I communicate with my friends in Spain on a weekly basis and can text them at any time. Um, that's just the opportunities are incredibly um, more. We have so many more opportunities than previous generations did just by having access to um, technology. We also expect creativity and innovation in everything that we do. Uh, we have we are in an age of predictive analytics where we uh, companies can identify our needs before we know that we have them. So most companies, most industries are uh, developing their programs and their uh, their products and services around what they expect our needs are going to be. So when I go on Facebook, for example, you see all these ads that are tailored specifically for you. I, um, I go on there and I see dog walking on demand and I'm like, how have I ever lived without this? I mean, it's like so ridiculous, but, um, but it's something that it, they are specifically innovating for the consumer. And, um, and I think that that's something that millennials now have, have become accustomed to expecting in every purchasing process. We're also very socially conscious. Over 50% of millennials say that they would pay more for a service or product that was doing some kind of social good. And when you start looking at how millennials are coming into the industry or, or what kind of jobs millennials want to take, they always say they want to be part of something that's bigger. They want to be part of something that's having a good impact. And the most important aspect to keep in mind with the millennial generation is that we are skeptical and we value authenticity. We are information consumers, but we don't believe all the information that's out there. We are, um, the statistic I think is fascinating that only 19% of millennials say most people can be trusted in contrast with 31% of just the previous generation. So we really care about companies and individuals who display authenticity and can show that they are someone we can trust. So uh, I'm going to walk through some best practices that will appeal to the millennial generation. First of all, the main point here is uh, customer relationships. Now, a lot of people think that customer relationships are, are, are very outdated with the millennial generation, but it's actually completely opposite. Just because we use text messaging a lot doesn't mean that there's a cold relationship between us. Um, I had a loan officer when I was buying my home a few years ago who we communicated mostly over text. And I found that by the end of it, he, he didn't show up to the closing table. And I, um, I was really surprised by that because I felt like we had become very close, having texted you know, at least a couple times a week and for a while, usually every day. And, um, and he was helping me make the biggest financial decision of my life. Um, so I felt very close to him, but I found out later that it was really, his perception was that I saw it as being, being a very transactional relationship, and that's why I was texting. But for me, having grown up with text, really, I, I see a, a lot, there's a lot more tonal relationship in my texting, and I, um, I feel like I am developing a relationship there. So um, it's kind of a different, again, like kind of shifting outside of the normal uh, worldview. Um, but part of being of having a good customer relationship is understanding your consumer, understanding where they are coming from. So, like in that example, I um, when he didn't show up for closing, he which I mean I realized later that that's not a common, super common practice. Though I would highly recommend it. Um, but he didn't understand where I was coming from, what I valued in the process. It's really important that you understand your consumer's cultures and. Um, and what they're expecting in the process. I use this example. This is a poll from uh, American Pacific Mortgage, their um, conference that I spoke at in the fall. Um, they really made a whole, the theme was shift 2015. And I think it's really important that all companies start implementing trainings that are around shifting the mindset to digital communication, to cultural knowledge. Um, they shared a lot of, of course, I did cultural training. Um, but this kind of thing is really critical for all companies to be participating in. And I found um, this is part of a product called the Culture Map that I provide to companies. But I want to just share an example that the training shouldn't be a one-off thing. You should, um, in my trainings, I provide a short email and text kind of um, and short videos that are communicating this kind of training on an ongoing basis. 
I heard a, a crazy stat that, that found that it takes 21 times for someone to hear something um, for them to actually make a change in behavior. And so it's important that your training doesn't happen just once, that it's consistent and, and in a way that doesn't disrupt your your day-to-day -day activities. And it, use text. I mean, it is really important that with today's consumers, you are communicating with text message. It sounds um, kind of basic, but a, a lot of people feel like it, it could be unprofessional if you text right, right away to your customer. But I know whenever I ultimately bought my car with CarMax, they sent me a text after my first time of going saying, hey, let me know if you had any questions. And it opened the door for me to have such an awesome experience. Because for me, it takes so much work to, um, and this sounds ridiculous. I know this sounds like very millennial entitled or something. But it feels like it would take so much work for me to look up the phone number to CarMax, find the person I was talking to, and then ask them a question. I mean, that's just really inconvenient. But if my the person that I met with sent me a quick text saying, hey, let me know if you have any questions, I can easily send those questions back, and I, I literally, like when I that happened at CarMax, I was like, this is an incredible experience. I mean, it just really, convenience is very key with millennials. And then celebrate with us. So this is me sitting at the closing table a few years ago when I bought my house, and my realtor took this photo, and he was incredible. I mean, sitting at the closing table is still easily one of the top five most memorable moments of my life. And I think sometimes in the industry we forget what that moment means to the first time home buyer. And millennials, of course, we love to celebrate. So um, I love to party a little bit. So if you can be part of that moment, though, one of the most memorable moments, um, then you are bonding with us. And my realtor did that. He took a photo. I have one with me holding a sold sign. And, um, and then shared, I was able to share that on social media, have other people celebrate with me. It was such an incredible moment that I will forever remember, and my realtor was part of that. And so I gave him so much business. Of course, he was a valuable realtor. He did a great job in the whole process, but that moment really sealed the deal for a future referral business. And then be authentic. Don't worry about what age you are or what, um, how much experience you have or what, um, if you have the right sales tactic or if you're not very great at text messaging, ultimately it's really important that you are yourself and you're someone that can be trusted. So um, the great thing about marketing in today's world is that you don't have to have the right sales tactic. It's really about um, being yourself and being someone that's pro providing and communicating that value. The second area that is um, really critical to reaching millennials is being an information resource. Um, millennials are just crazy information consumers who want as much as possible. And so if you can set yourself up, up as a resource, this is an example of someone using Mortgage Coach, um, that just, it creates an experience where, again, we can trust you and we believe that you're a guide in the process. Um, so we go online, find so much crazy information out there, and then we are able to come to you and you say, look, I'm, I'm going to be a guide through this process. I'm going to help you navigate this crazy world of um, a lot of information and difficult things to understand. Put it in a language that you can understand by using this app and, and different tools. Uh, and then you are setting yourself up as a companion to Google. You're not going to get rid of Google. You're not going to say, um, okay, don't do your research. That's not going to let me trust you. You're going to say, I'll help you navigate through this process. Here's an example of someone sharing on social media um, this kind of value. And this is an awesome example of just showing how if you put it in plain language, you show them, look, this is your option here and this is your option here. Uh, we're able to, to make a decision that we feel confident in and that we feel like we can trust you with in helping us make that decision. So this is just a, an awesome example of that. And then also, when you're working with realtors, make sure that you are, are setting yourself up as a resource to them as well. The more that you can help them understand their consumers and be, be a resource through that, um, you, you set yourself up as an expert and someone who can be trusted in the process as well. Um, so getting that referral business in um, through kind of shareable information 
um, videos, that kind of thing, can really be helpful for um, reaching the and becoming a, a, a great resource for your, your realtor relationships as well. And then be relevant. This is, I just had a call yesterday with Dan Keller, who's been, I know I've been on a few of these calls with you, and he does an awesome job of just giving out value to realtors and of course his, um, his customers as well. But we did a call where I, he, we got on Google Hangouts, and, um, which is another video platform, and did a quick interview about how to reach millennials, and then he's sharing that with his realtor relationships. I thought this is such a great way to use technology and uh, make it very uh, relational. And so he's, you know, right there. You can he's talking to you and um, and then providing expertise. So just think about those platforms. Like be where your customers and your realtors are. Um, go to them, which is how you can leverage technology to do that. He also does a um, beers and home buying class um, through. He works with some. I can't remember actually. It's like Amazon people, his customers. He sets up a um, home buying class in a bar, and they discuss it over beer. And that's just a great way, a great example of being where your customers are. Um, thinking about what are they interested in, they're nervous about this process, and so be uh, in a place where they feel comfortable. It's the same thing about looking at social media and that kind of thing. You're um, going you're putting the message in front of them where they feel they can read it and read it comfortably. And um, this is another example that I thought was awesome um, of a realtor who is demonstrating value and um, she, Tina is an awesome realtor, does a really high level of production and, um, and she shared this value on social media. Um, this is an example of just being able to continually be a resource and expert in the industry. And that brings me to the last point, which is digital strategy. This is, of course, integrated throughout. Digital strategy is not a separate kind of place. It's, um, it is integral in our world now. Uh, we are part of the digital world, and so you have to communicate in today's digital world. Um, this is your primary touch with the consumer. It's also your first touch. Because like I said before, people generate, they are looking for referrals. They get a, a referral from a parent and a friend and they go on Facebook and say, hey, I'm buying a home, anyone have a good realtor or lender? Um, but then from there, they do some research online. Most people only interview one, one realtor and one lender. One, but the process before that is a preliminary interview, basically. We're going online, looking at social media sites, looking at your website, seeing what kind of person you are and whether you are going to get to the top of my list in terms of providing someone who I think will provide the most value. So um, you know, meeting us where we are, creating a modern mortgage experience is uh, really important to helping us understand that you will be someone who understands us and who, who we can trust. So think about basic things like your website design. As sad as it might seem, we will judge you based on your website. And I hate to say that, but I mean, if your website looks really outdated, we might subconsciously even just think your information is going to be outdated or you don't get me. And so um, it doesn't take that much to just um, create a basic website that's simple and, uh, and functional and modern. Make sure it's clean. Make sure you have designers who are keeping in mind what millennials and, um, and just in general, what, what people are looking for. Social media, um, we, this is a necessity. This is absolutely where we are, we're communicating. And while it definitely has its compliance issues and in this industry can be very difficult to navigate, um, there's some basic things you can do to, to make sure that you are able to do that in a compliant way. Um, but first of all, social media is not just a place for um, learning kind of some basic or learning about your um, business. It's also where we're going to look to you to see what kind of person you are. Um, New American Funding does an awesome job with this. They are um, they do a lot of stuff on Instagram and different platforms. And this is just an example of an authentic post. You want it to be something that's coming from um, like a place of experience. So this is a picture of someone's home theater, um, which is a great example. And be informative, be helpful. So My Mutual has, um, has this post where 
It's just, do you need, do you have the documents you need? And you can look to find out more information. We utilize a tool to make sure it's more compliant with our customers. So we provide the kind of information, and then um, you can share that easily. Or um, loan officers can receive this in their email and then share it um, directly to their pages. And so utilizing tools like that, we have that. There's a lot out there that um, allow you to do that in a way that you set up the posts they see, and then they can easily just share those. So I recommend leveraging tools like that. And then, of course, customer reviews. We're looking online at customer reviews. We want to see that information. Um, the mortgage reel of this guy I met recently, and, um, and Jason, that Dave had recommended I look into, he does an awesome job on Yelp and has um, generates a lot of business, a lot of leads this way. Um, so really encouraging, I encourage you guys to set up Yelp pages if you don't have one. Um, this is a great way to, to make sure that you are, are leveraging the, um, what we're looking for. And then of course, utilize Mortgage Coach. This is the best way to communicate information to your consumer and make sure that you look like the expert that you are and that it's being communicated in our language. Um, create a, an open house experience that shows that you're living in the modern age and that you are going to be a valuable resource. Create a modern, this is a modern lender's office experience. Um, be that resource in, in the modern age. And, um, and so lastly, I just want to go over briefly how I can be of assistance. I would love to be a resource for you no matter what. I mean, just as, a, as an ongoing um, kind of form of, of communicating this kind of help to you. Um, first of all, I'll be sharing market updates and just general kind of tips and strategies over the Rate Watch app, and you'll be able to share those videos with realtors. So I'm really excited to be able to do that. Um, and secondly, as a company, we offer digital marketing solutions like social media and websites, and I'm also happy to answer any questions in the future around just how to best leverage those kinds of platforms. And lastly, uh, corporate strategy related to recruiting, re retaining it, um, millennial and diverse talent, as well as compliance with Section 342 um, diversity regulations in the industry. So um, I also have a, a new product called Culture Map that um, I've shown kind of at some examples throughout, but it includes the basic education that's on an ongoing basis around uh, reaching millennials and multicultural segments. Um, this, this kind of shareable content and, um, of course, the company strategy, corporate strategy as well, as, as well as some ongoing Q&A um, to anyone who is subscribing. So I know I've gone over a little bit, but if you have any information or you would like more information and like to stay up to date on um, new products that we're releasing and um, just kind of some of the articles and videos that I'll be releasing on this type of information, you can text me at um, the text mortgage coach to 555-888 or visit my website. And, um, and then, of course, follow me on Twitter because I am a millennial. I'm all over social media. So let's connect and stay in touch. But um, I would like to pass it over to Dan and um, would love to hear, Dan and Dave, your, your comments on all this. Love it. You crushed it, Kristen. So. Uh, I've interviewed you a number of times. I mean, you, you knocked it out of the park. Dan, before I provide a minute of my thoughts on it, anything you want to add after hearing Kristen's presentation? Well, not so much add. I, I guess a couple questions. I, I'd love to hear your, your observation on, on a couple things, Kristen. One is you, you mentioned that um, millennials are viewing home buying more as an investment you know, than the warm and fuzzy white picket fence feeling that us baby boomers grew up with. And I guess I'm wondering, well, I think I kind of know because you, you all saw the whole market crash in 08. You know, I remember my daughter was in college saying, oh, yeah, I'm going to be able to buy a house. Um, but then when she got out of college, she was scared to death to buy a house because, you know, she just saw something could get crushed. But now that she's bought a house, she's starting to view it back as the picket fence mentality. So do you mm -hmm. see that maybe that steps as you're getting into the house later? Yeah, you know, it. It um, part of that is, age in life, you know, a lot of people who are also getting married and having kids, that kind of thing, um, that changes your perspective a little bit. Um, and then also regional differences make a big difference. So I don't know um, where she's located, but that can that can have an impact on, um, like people, I moved to LA recently from Oklahoma, and um, the climate in Oklahoma and, and LA obviously are very different. 
um, people are tend to buy homes that are are more it's more of an emotional decision um, in some of the more rural areas mm -hmm. um, but mm -hmm. at the same time it's it's I think both of them like it is an emotional attachment yeah. to your home where you're building your community but it's also a um, it's I think always going to be some level of uh, financial decision like logical decision to buy a house sure yeah thanks I think and then the other thing this is a quick one uh, I'm confused myself uh, where does Facebook uh, begin or, or end and Instagram and Snapchat end. So my, my 30 some odd year old daughter, uh, she's still a Facebook girl. Uh, my my 16 and a half year old says Facebook is dumb and dorky. Um, it's all Instagram and, and Snapchat. So so how mm -hmm. do how do you want to be talked to? Yeah, I I still think Facebook is extremely relevant for um, home buyer relationships and realtor relationships. Um, I think that it's it's may be phasing out with the younger generation, uh, like after millennials. Um, but as of right now, it's still extremely a, a great way to be relational, like be in a friendship with your, your customers, um, while as long as you're keeping it professional, obviously. And you can post pictures of your kids or whatever, but uh, that was a great way for me to remember that my realtor was still around. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I would see him post a picture of his kid, and then I would think, Oh man, I have a friend who's buying a house right now. I need to connect to them, and so um, so I, I think it's extremely relevant. Twitter is relevant, um, and then Instagram is obviously all photos, but you can really leverage that to be able to um, to show an experience to millennials. Right. But Snapchat, right. I would say, hold off on for now because yeah. unless you realtors, I think, have an opportunity there where you can show you know open houses and any house that you're looking at um, do a quick snap of that and I would totally follow that but it has to be really authentic I mean you have to be very careful about not doing any sales messaging on um, on most any platform but especially snapchat but, um, right. but yeah, I think Facebook is still very relevant I actually when I moved to LA I Good. people laughed at me really hard because I, I said so do you guys still like connect on Facebook and everyone was like uh, yes <laughs> Who do you think we are? <laughs> so, so it's not out. Still a great place good. to be. Good. Good. I feel that way too. Thank you. All right. All right. So hey, good good questions. I do want to remind everybody I had interviewed Tina Bellevue, who is a top Keller Williams agent. I mean, she's a top one percenter, uh, and she she gets all of her business through Facebook. So that interview from a few months ago is if you want to hear from one of the nation's top realtors. Who really get who is a millennial and who's crushing it on Facebook for realtors? Check that out. I think the point I want to make, Kristen, is when I listen. To, you know, I've heard you give this presentation a number of times, and when I think of you know value lost in translation, I mean, I can say that about everybody. You know, whether you're a boomer, mm -hmm. whether you're an Xer. Uh, when I think of response time, I mean, that's a mortgage industry best practice that we all learned really quick. That the that response time matters, you know. I mean, in the mm -hmm. consumer direct side of our business, you know, the fastest responder wins. Uh, you know, when I think of the salesy approach, uh, I mean, we live in a skeptical society. While no doubt millennials mm -hmm. are even more skeptical than my generation, you know, we're all there. I mean, you know, it, I guess what I want to net out is if a lender got serious around crushing it with millennials, I think they'd crush it with everybody. I mean, we're yeah. all. The same thing, I think I think the millennial is just the apex of where we're at in our society. I mean they mm -hmm. are the, the extreme. Yeah, they're the extreme. They are the digital, you know, native. So mm -hmm. uh, you know, one of my goals with this call that I again, this is just what I believe, uh, is I believe that this is a great opportunity right now for everybody to get mobile savvy, for everybody to get digital savvy. And whether you're comfortable and you're a top producer today. I would just say your job will be easier, more efficient, and better if you get with it. And and I do believe that it, that the millennial movement is a 2016 opportunity. I I talk to a lot of CEOs, and I still talk to CEOs. It's like, yeah, you know, it's coming, it's trending. You know, three years from now, it'll be where the puck is. Well, I, I think there is a puck there now. And um, I don't know, Dan, if you agree with that. It's a 2016 opportunity. Any any comments before we? Bring you on, Dan, and we provide our update. Comments from me or from Kristen? No, from you. Do you believe that the yeah. millennial opportunity is today? It's not two years from now. 
a absolutely. I also can tell you it, it's going to grow exponentially in the next two to three years by 2018. And I talk about the demographics a bit in my presentation. Um, you want to get in now because if you wait a year or two, you're kind of too late. But, but the millennials every, every day are getting more and more into home buying ages. So I think in the next two years it gets really big. And so I guys, think we already – see a, a large amount of people enter millennials entering the marketplace, but there's a lot more who would if they understood what's going on and if they had someone who would guide them through that process. That's a great point. Got it. So guys, hey, this call is going to go over because Dan's content, I mean, Kristen crushed it. Dan is going to crush it. I mean, this, this may be one of the most valuable calls uh, in the first half of the year. I think that what Kristen gave you know, is a great conversation to have at real estate offices. There's a great lunch and learn to be had here. So we made her slides to, um, to, to share. And I think what Dan is going to provide is going to be equally as relevant and valuable. I, you know, I mean, I think in terms of what's happening with rates and to be that expert for families, it's huge. So everybody on this call, you have Rate Watch. You know, I'm flipping through some screens as I talk. I see a lot of mortgage coach professionals putting this on their desktop. Uh, more than ever, I'm seeing that. But uh, you know, one of the I'm going to announce a new feature that some of you may know, some of you may not know. But in the commentary, you know, everybody on this call, you guys know Dan Rolich. I mean, he's he's providing this awesome morning update. You can now click the share button um, in iOS, and you can share that with realtors. You can email it. You can text it. And there's even a Facebook button. So I did want to one make an announcement of that new feature. I also wanted to make an announcement that Kristen has agreed to create an awesome, you know, Ask a Millennial video a couple times a month. So, you know, we don't know whether this is going to be, you know, two times a month, three times a month. Kristen's like, I don't want to commit to a time because I don't want to create noise. I want to provide the mortgage coach community with a video when I think it's awesome. So another new feature. We've got Kristen's, you know, Ask a Millennial that will be in here. And, and the whole thing is being shared. You can share it with your realtors. One click of a button, you can Facebook it, you can email it, you can text it. So um, with no further ado, you know, Dan has been creating, you know, I think some of the industry's best content for many years in Mortgage Coach. You know, his daily updates, they're timely, they're relevant. And when you think of transparency in our industry, I don't think there is a executive, a leader in our industry that just shows up with more authenticity and value than Dan. So Dan, I'm really grateful for your day-to-day -day updates in the mortgage coach community. And I'm gonna pass off the screen to you and look forward to you providing with uh, the mortgage coach community an awesome update that will help them and something that they can share with their realtors. Great, uh, and before I, I jump in, Dave, I just wanted to tell you, uh, I'm going to co-host co a video with Kristen. She doesn't know this yet, but uh, she's going to be doing Ask a Millennial. I'm going to be saying, doing Ask a Grandpa, and I think I will really give a lot of perspective. There's no oh. way you're Grandpa, but um, I would love to I'm going to be a Grandpa in this school. Wow, that. congratulations. Thank you. I'm pretty excited. You don't look it. <laughs> Thank you. I like you. Okay, so am I ready to roll, Dave? Rock it out, Dan. Looking forward to it. All right. First, first slide. Uh, this is my baby Otis. You all know Otis. Um, see the black on his face. He literally ate the entire ceramic fireplace log in our fireplace. This was a couple weeks ago, and my wife is just screaming at him, saying, "How stupid are you?" So I said, "I'm really uh, sorry, but I have a lot of anxiety about the Chinese stock market." All right. So I like to critique myself, as you know. I've been doing this this annual forecast every year for gosh, a lot of years. I've been using the same model uh, virtually, well, not virtually, I've been using the same model every year, and the model's been incredibly accurate. Um, now, one of the reasons the model's very accurate, and this is why I was really happy to be paired up with Kristen today, is my entire economic point of view, all my forecasting really derives from what I call the 49-year economic lag. <laughs> and, and that is that, that humans move in cycles as we age, we, our buying preferences change, our habits change, and so it's easy to overlay that filter. Run everything through that filter, and you're going to tend to be more accurate, and you don't get caught up in all the daily noise. I mean, that's why when, when the market's saying, oh, you know, the Fed's going to do this, and rates are going to do that, um, and I say, yeah, the Fed's going to do this, but rates aren't going to do that. I, I, I feel very confident when I say those things, because my filter is, what's the demographic of the population doing? 
And, and if the baby boomers are getting older and not buying as much, and the economy's not going to pick up again until the millennials hit their peak buying age. So, so that, that, that really is demographics is, is where it's at. And, and studying the millennials and understanding um, that whole sector is going to be huge for you. So this is what I said last year. Uh, this is exactly the slide I showed last year. And it talked about China masking some problems. Oh, guess what? <laughs> they uh, really were masking some problems as we watched the Chinese market. I said Europe is weak. That's only beginning to show itself. Watch what happens to Germany in the next year or so. Big, big trouble coming there. We have worldwide rates sub 1%. Again, I did this over a year ago. Uh, the D German bond is now 0.23. Think about that for a minute. It's actually a negative interest rate when you, uh, when you put in inflation. I, uh, I told you that there were more deflation concerns and inflation concerns. And I told you that I believed that there was an oil bubble created by the Fed. And when I did this, oil was at about $70 a barrel. Um, and at that time, I, I forecasted, I thought oil would hit, would, would touch 30s, and, and it has now it's in the 20s. And I said, this is where I was wrong last year. The 10-year would, would, would drop below 1.5%. It would stay there for a sustained period. Now, the reason that I was wrong uh, was actually just, it's just a miracle because it's never happened before. That was a joke. Um, was because of this whole Fed talk about the Fed increasing rates. Uh, uh, and, and so the market got overly focused on them. As you know, I wasn't. I kept saying it doesn't matter what the Fed does. The, the market, long end of the market is going to do what the long end of the market does. Um, but but the, the rumors and talk overshadowed any sign of reality. Uh, I said there'd be no income growth. Retail sales would fall. Man, that's sure happening. Um, and I reminded everybody that historic recovery, always throughout history, back to the Depression, has been a GDP in the 5% or above range. Heck, we haven't seen over 2.5%. I think we touched 3% at one time. So this has never been really an economy that's recovered back, back from 08. So what's changed since that slide last year? Nothing good's changed. Oh, by the way, a lot of these first slides have a little bit of a negative tone to them. But stay with me because this plays into, I think, one of the best times that we will ever experience in our industry. I've long said that we are the morticians of the economy. It's kind of sick, but it's like, hey, unemployment was up, woo! Rates are going to go down, we're going to refi. So we're a little twisted in that, in, that, in that regard. So, and I don't see the world crashing. I don't see, you know, a major currency crisis. Um, and, uh, so, so keep that in mind. There's a negative twist here, but it really plays into what I think is going to happen in terms of uh, good interest rates and good home buying. Chinese stock market's crashing, no doubt. The Fed's recently released inflation model calls for 1.4% inflation. That's not enough. And I believe that we're going to see something more like about a half a percent inflation. And that starts really fearing deflation. And deflation is, deflation is the greatest curse. It's destroyed Japan over the last decade and a half now. Uh, and, and you're watching it come to other countries. GDP is likely to be revised down below 1%. I think we're going to see GDP down around 0.3, 0.4, which again is sliding into a uh, recession. I, I actually believe we, we might really be in a recession right now. We just don't know it yet. Um, the S&P aggregate companies, if you take all the companies in the S&P and you put them all together, they're showing declining earnings and negative uh, uh, profits. Wow. And again, this has been known for a long time, but the market was snorting crack every day that the Fed was laying out on the table along with the razor blade. <laughs> That's over. The, the market's not snorting crack anymore. Uh, smoke and mirrors are being used to prop up stock prices. I don't have a lot of time to go into this, but I will tell you that I took a short position on IBM. I voted against Warren Buffett about nine months ago, and it's been an amazing trade. Why? Because IBM stock kept going up, yet their sales kept going down, and I said, why? And when you really looked under the covers, you could see that IBM had been buying back all of their stock, taking all their cash, buying back stock, which the market foolishly loves. But when a big company buy back its stock, that says to me they don't have anything else to do with their money. They have nothing good to do, so they're just going to buy back their stock. When you buy back your stock, you have less shares, and you take your earnings, divide by those shares, and it actually makes the stock go up. But in fact, it's a dying company. I, I don't want to you know, vote against Big Blue, but that's kind of what's happening. They've got to figure it out. There's a lot of companies taking that strategy right now. They can't grow their sales, so they buy back their stock. Oil, $35 per barrel. This is when I did this, uh, and I said heading to $20 in my opinion. Well, it touched 20 yesterday. Um, and then the oil fractors, these are the guys that are drilling for shale oil in the Dakotas. 
um, they are beginning to default on their high interest bonds. I'll go into more of that later. And the junk bond market is melting down. Any non-quality uh, bond is, is getting hammered. So, so there's going to be a continued flight to quality into, into mortgage-backed securities and the 10-year. And I think the 10-year yield, I say that we are the best-looking house in a bad neighborhood. Um, U.S. Treasuries make the most sense. We're paying the highest yields in the world. And, and I think that, that from a full-on picture, we literally are the best-looking house on the block. Uh, and then corporate debt is a huge concern. It's 140% higher than it was during the Great Recession in 08. So companies are more leveraged than ever, which means they're less prepared for, for what's coming, and that's slowing sales. Rents are skyrocketing, and it's forcing millennials to buy homes. <laughs> that is a fact. Um, now, I'd like to talk a little bit about how Chinese, uh, how the Chinese buyers have impacted our market. And this is a quick slide on what's been happening in Chinese real estate. This is their home prices back in uh, kind of going from 2015 through, and, and you can see that it just gets falling and falling and falling and falling. So, so that market's getting hurt. And because the Chinese market's been hurt so much, uh, they're starting to pull out of California. And so uh, you can see in the past, uh, Chinese exceeded all other foreign buyers by, by a huge amount, $30 billion in real estate purchase versus you know, 10 and 8 and 5 billion from other, some big countries, by the way. Uh, this was a quote from a, from a local builder, Shea Holmes. He said uh, that uh, he's seen a significant slowdown in Chinese buyers in Orange County. The buyer is really drying up. He says, I don't think that's a bad thing. I think it's a great thing. Nothing against Chinese coming in to buy real estate. But you got to admit, man, those, those guys pay with cash, and that just doesn't help our business. So you, you take a 30%, uh, uh, you take 30 of the market out, that's going to help our buyers with inventory. It's going to take a little air out of the sales, which we need, and it's going to create more, more loans for us to, to do. So I really think it's a good thing, and it's a more normalized thing. Um, this is what, uh, this is, I, I did this slide on December 30th, uh, just to put things in perspective so you can see when I did my annual forecast. Uh, GDP was 2.5%, S&P was running at 2,000, um, gold was 1,000 and oil is 36, and the treasuries were 2.3. So a lot of what I'm predicting in this forecast is actually already played out. Uh, the check questions will, will continue to play out. Um, OK, inflation, I, I'm going to breeze through some of these slides. Uh, this model says that inflation probably is at about half a percent. And maybe throughout the year, we slowly claw, claw our way back you know, into the 1.5 range. Um, and then by the end of the year, we should see a little bit of increase in inflation. What I get a kick out of is I hear all these economists saying, inflation cannot stay this low. It's not normal. Inflation always goes up. And to that, I, yeah, I went back and I, and I found this 100-year chart on inflation. And as you can see here, from the 40s through into, say, the mid-70s, this was a really ugly time I got in the business here, guys. Um, inflation for, what is that, 30 or 40 years was near 0%. That is not abnormal by any stretch. What's abnormal is what we saw since then. Uh, so I think that this is this is this is not unheard of, and it could very well continue for the next 15 or 20 years. And you you're just not going to have high interest rates when you have low inflation. You, you really can't actually. Uh, and then I also like to talk about long-term interest rates. Long-term interest rates. Yeah, we say, oh, they're so low. How can this be sustainable? Once again, I show you. From about the mid 30s to about the mid 70s, uh, sorry, this one's about the mid 60s. We had interest rates about where they are now. They're a little lower now. And, and guess what, everyone? Did that did that correlate with the inflation chart I just showed you? Yes, of course it does. So 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 inflation is such a big driver in our lives. Um, now, what drives inflation? Employment growth. That's going nowhere, in my opinion. I think you're going to continue to see. Uh, very few jobs created, and in fact, you're going to start seeing um, uh, negative creation in, in the job world, which is going to play into my, my, my interest rate forecast. Uh, we'll see how that pans out. U.S. retail sales, I think they're going to continue to fall. This, again, plays into the GDP forecast uh, and why I think we might slowly, if not already, slipped into a recession. That's not that bad of a word. We've grown up thinking that's the worst thing in the world. Now, a horrible recession is horrible, but a mild recession is mild, and, and, and it's not that bad for our industry. You don't want to see people out of work, uh, but the alternative is full employment and massive inflation and things get out of control. 
Uh, I love this slide because everybody is talking about housing starts and how phenomenal they are. And so what I will tell you is, yeah, they're going to stay phenomenal, but then I hear people saying, well, they just can't stay this good. It's too good. Look at how much we've climbed. Yeah, look how much we've climbed since 2009. Check this out. This, this is where housing starts have been for the last 50 years, way up here, right? So if I were to draw a line kind of across to create an average, I would say average housing starts is somewhere around 1,600 homes. We're barely trying to push 1,200 homes. So as good as we think housing starts are, especially the millennials, because their, their economic horizon is kind of, typically most of our economic horizons begin when we get out of college. But, but so much has happened before that, obviously. So, so this is not as good as we think. Um, I think that housing has got a long way to go before it fully recovers. It's a good thing for our business. Uh, oil, uh, I think it continues to fall. You can see my forecast takes it down into the 20s. Uh, and then sometime at 18, it starts climbing back out. But in, in the meantime, there's going to be such an incredible massacre because these fracking companies cost them about $70, $75 a barrel of oil to pull that out of the shale. It was such a boom industry. I mean, you have these oil workers literally like covered in grease driving Rolls Royces in North Dakota. Um, it is highly leveraged. All the fracking companies borrowed significantly. They have huge debt with high interest rates, and now they're creating oil that costs them uh, $75 a barrel, and they're trying to sell it for 25 you tell me how long can that last? It's not. So they're they're starting to default on their bonds, and that's going to create, I think, more of a junk bond crisis, which plays into lower rates. The Fed funds, I believe, I actually don't believe this slide anymore, although I just did it about a month, month and a half ago. Um, this showed the progression of the Fed's four increases, trying to get Fed funds rate back to 1%. My full, strong belief was sometime mid to the end of the year, they say, whoop, sorry, and they have to cave it all the way back down. I don't even think they get that high anymore before they say, whoops, sorry. I think they might even say, whoops, sorry, in the next quarter or two. We'll see. But once again, Fed funds rate, who cares, it does not have any effect on long-term interest rates. It just doesn't. That's, a, that's probably really a longer story. Um, and so the thing that you all care about most, what does that mean for mortgage rates? What it means is they're still really high, <laughs> and they're going to get a lot lower, uh, and they're going to continue to fall throughout the year. Um, and even, even as they start increasing into uh, – and this, by the way, this takes you all the way through 2017. So really into late 2017 is when you start rising. And 2018, they get kind of high. But this is because of the, the, the whole demographic belief that I have that the millennials will reach more of their peak buying age. Um, I want to take a minute to just talk about those demographics and put them into perspective for you. So the crash happened in 2007, correct? We will call it 2008. Now, my belief about demographics is that, uh, and this has been proven through a lot of research, that uh, humans reach their peak buying ages at 49 years old. At, so in our 40s, it's still about bigger, better, fancier, right? And about 49, something shifts, and I hate that it shifted in me because I still think of myself as a young-hearted guy, but it shifted, and I didn't care about a big house anymore. I cared about a 10-year mortgage instead of a 30-year mortgage. And I was fine having a smaller home so I could get that 10-year mortgage with the same payment as my big, stupid house had on the 30-year mortgage. Um, I didn't care so much about fancy cars, but I still love cars. I still love toys. But my peak buying absolutely started tapering down at 49 years old. Now, guess when the, mass, the, the largest population of baby boomers hit age 49? 2007. So it's no coincidence that this market crashed. We can blame the subprime. Yeah, it has something to do with it. This next crash will blame the oil fractors. But I'm telling you, it has more to do with the aging demographics. The reason that I say Germany is about to get in big trouble, they just went through their 49-year uh, uh, demographic, and the plunge begins. And they have this huge problem with just massive amounts of people migrating into that country. Um, so their, their, their stuff's coming. And once again, that will help our interest rates. Uh, this is a great slide. Um, what this tells you is what's happening today, and, and I've talked about this slide for a long time, and it's reason, again, why I don't get so moved by all the noise and all the, you know, the Fed doing this and all that. And I, I just really look at long-term uh, movement, and this interest rate, the 10-year Treasury has been in a long-term downward channel since 1989. Now, there are times where you think, oh, my gosh, rates are out of control, but guess what? 
they're not. We're still in the channel. And so sometimes a big movement is actually healthy because we got to go back up and test the channel every once in a while. And so you can see where this channel leads you. And so when I say I think we're going to see a 10-year bond around 1.2, 1.15, all I'm doing is following this channel down. Now, um, could we get a small spike before? It's possible. Um, but I'm not as concerned about it because there are a lot of people that thought that the taper tantrum, when everybody's crying about the Fed tapering, selling off their bond, they thought that that was going to drive us to the top shelf. It didn't. Now, they're, now we're fearing central bank selling. I'll show you a slide why that's not a concern for mine. But even if we did dip up a little bit, we're still in a long-term uh, a move down. So uh, I'm almost done here. This is um, who holds our bonds. And as you can see, back in 2000, only 900 billion in bonds were held by foreign countries, both developed and emerging. And as you can see now, 6.2 trillion, 11 times, are held by uh, uh, foreign countries. Now, most of these countries, believe it or not, are emerging. You can see the, the gray line is emerging. These are countries that are just having good times. Life is good. they got to put their money somewhere. We are a great bet. Some of the established countries developed, you might see a little bit of selling here. But this is just a drip in the bucket of, of overall treasuries being held. Uh, this slide kind of tells you the same thing. And what you have to keep in mind is this whole bottom half of this of this people that hold our treasuries, they're not going to sell them. The Fed and the government do not sell treasuries contrary to what people believe. Um, yeah, there's been some tapering. But overall, the Fed just kind of makes them go away. They don't necessarily dump them into the market. Uh, and here's proof of that. So this is a 12-month rolling sum of net purchases. Uh, all the fear and all the taper tantrum occurred here. But as you know, the Fed was just dumping. They got back in a bottle a little more. They've been dumping like crazy. And what's happening? Rates are going down. They're not going up. So this is such a vast market. I don't care what the Chinese does. I don't care what, what India does. I don't care what our Fed does. There's a lot of treasuries out there, and we are the best-looking house in the not-so-great neighborhood. Um, GDP. Again, it, I, my slide shows is getting down to almost one. I, I almost things are happening so fast right now since my forecast. I almost need to update this because I think this gets us closer to zero before it turns up again. All right. So in summary, I want to wrap this up for you. Um, GDP, retail sales, inflation all dip. The dollar will soar, and that's going to put more 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 pressure on exports, which is going to hurt GDP. Corporate corporate debt is higher than it's been uh, since 2008. Uh, U.S. bonds are in very safe hands. The Chinese debacle will take the air out of home prices. It's going to bring back affordability. Uh, Fed is forced to say oops and pull back rates. Junk, ban junk, bo junk bonds will probably crash much worse. The 10-year will hit record lows and continue down because we're the only safe haven in the world. And a possible spike in rates when junk bonds first crash. People might say, oh, all bonds are bad. But the fact is they're going to figure out they've got to get the quality. Uh, ten year continues their twenty six year ride down the channel. I don't see that stopping. And then, uh, and then uh, now for my shameless uh, promo, I'm gonna let Dave really, really run with this one. But I, I love, I love that I was matched with with Kristen. In fact, I want to talk to Kristen uh, afterwards to see if there's other ways we can work together. Because my demographic beliefs tie so closely into the millennials, uh, I'm gonna be speaking at some live events, uh, and Terry Shodine is gonna be the uh, to, to be the uh, the primary speaker, and uh, Terry is the best-selling author uh, of a book, Small Message, Big Impact. She spoke, spoke at our sales rep. She's amazing, and she really talks about each generation, from the great generation to the boomers to the millennials. Done tons of research, and uh, so so we're kind of paired up because again, my, my economic uh, viewpoints have a lot to do with demographics, and she's going to talk a lot about that. So those events are going to be in San Diego, uh, uh, Inland Empire, and in San Ramon. And I think Dave's going to share more with you on that. And the last thing, I wasn't going to share this, but um, oh, there's a quick flyer on the event. Sorry, Dave. Um, uh, I had this in there because it's something I did for, for my company. Uh, I was asked, I, we work with Building Champions a lot, and, uh, and uh, Greg Harkavy said, hey, let's create a one-word vision for, for what this year is going to look like uh, for, for, for your region. And um, I came up with the word magic. Now, magic is a very special word to me because you guys all know that I love to sail and I love my boat very much. And about, I don't know, four years ago, my daughter was 12 and 12-year-old 12 Mishnati. And we were driving to San Diego and she was fishing all the way. And she said, why do you even need a new boat? You have a boat. And I said, you know, honey, no matter how old we get, we still need some magic in our lives. 
when I got to San Diego and looked at this boat, the boat's name was Magic. And my wife, who really didn't want to buy a boat, <laughs> grabbed my shoulders and said, oh, my God, I have the chills. You're supposed to have this boat. And I said, yeah, baby. So um, I turned Magic into an acronym. And uh, so real quickly, so here's what it means to me. And you guys can have this if you want. We're going to be hanging it in all of our branches. And motivate those we touch. We all have the power to lift one another up. And I think we have that obligation. Don't drag down. Lift up. Adopt and adapt. We can't control the changes in the economy, but we can adapt what we, we can change what we do about it. We have to grow. If you don't grow, you're going to die. Uh, infectious enthusiasm. We, our attitude is infectious, so you might as well bring enthusiasm to the table and not some downward, gloomy point of view. And last thing is control your own destiny. Don't let the market define you. It's great I'm saying all these great things. God forbid I'm wrong about everything I said. Who cares? Winners win no matter what the market is. You don't want to be the guy that only succeeds because the rising tide lifted your boat. Make sure you control your own destiny. I'm done. Boom. Man, <laughs> what an awesome call. You know, uh, Kristen, you completely crushed it. I've been getting uh, text messages, chats. So are you still with us, Kristen? Because, you know, millennial yes. Kristen, you're not Facebook. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> we got things to do. <laughs> uh, no, this is an incredible presentation. I'm going to rewatch this. Thanks so much, Dan, for sharing. That was awesome. So, Thank so you. by the way, do, do Kristen, do millennials like you know this type of nerdy knowledge? You know, is this is this attractive to a millennial? Yes, that's actually. I was going to say. I mean, even some of this information you could share with consumers, and we would eat it up. I mean, we want as much information as possible. We might not understand it right away, but if you explain it, and um, but yeah, putting those graphs out there and, sh and explaining exactly why uh, rates have are falling or why now is a good time to buy, or that maybe a couple months ago was a little bit better, I mean, just being transparent and sharing this kind of information is really awesome with millennial consumers. Beautiful. So, and by the way, so do, so do most Xers, so do boomers. We all want to work with an expert, and Dan, you're your commentary and your update is a complete gift. I'm, I'm grateful. Uh, everybody, I'm gonna, we're, as a team, we're going to, obviously this recording will be online, but I'm also going to split it into two so that this so, can be something that's shareable. want to remind you now that the commentary that is in RateWatch is now one click away from you sharing it, you know, whether you want to email it, text it. By the way, uh, SMS means text. I had someone ask me that the other day. Whether you want to text it, Facebook it, or whether you just want to clip it to a clipboard and cut and paste it into some other way to, to forward it or market it. Uh, I do want to remind everybody that we are basically doing mobile training every Wednesday at 11 o'clock. I do believe being a digital native, the, the millennials have an advantage. But heck, I'm over 50 and I can do a lot with my mobile device. I want every mortgage coach member to be able to crush it on mobile. So tomorrow, if you want to sign up for that, it is in chat below. Also, I put a link to the event that Dan's going to be at in chat. Uh, I'm going to actually try to make it by at least one of those events myself just because I'm a big fan of, of, of Terry and I'm a big fan of Dan's. So hopefully I'll be there at least at one of those. Uh, but anyways, lots of action to take. Obviously, Chris, I had a number of questions come in on Kristen. How do we connect with her? I put that link below. So, so, folks, we have gone over. Uh, I'm actually not going to apologize for it because I think the information speaks for itself. But I would like to know what everybody thinks. So I did just post a poll. Did we crush it? Did we waste your time? Are you mad that we went over? Let me know. And, of course, if you're a guest and you're new to our community, uh, click that last option that you want to learn more and get a demo of Mortgage Coach, and we'll reach out to you. So, by the way, Dan and Kristen, uh, I think this might be one of the top rated calls of all times, uh, the major, uh, the vast majority of people are saying, wow, you surpassed my expectations. It was all Kristen, I'm sure of that. No way. Okay. This is great to be on a call with you, Dan. This is extremely informative for me, so thanks for having me. All right, guys. So, hey, last, last thought. I want to remind everybody that you can go to our Mortgage Coach website, click on the Connect menu item and go to our calendar and stay connected with our education. And by the way, we're doing a live educational event every single day of the week. Every Tuesday, I'm interviewing someone awesome. Every Wednesday, we're rocking it out um, with uh, mobile. Every Thursday, we're just helping you use our technology better. 
and Monday and Tuesday we've got something great too. So Kristen and Dan, thanks so much for making time to give this kind of value. I'm grateful for both of you. Thanks, thanks so much for having us. All right. Diego. Take care. All right. Diego, 25th. All right, guys. Don't miss Dan's event. And again, uh, just a reminder, San Diego on the 24th, March on the 3rd, San Ramon, Northern California on March 10th. Check it out. Take care, everybody. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, everyone.